Good afternoon and welcome to the regular Friday meeting of the City Club of Portland. I am Jim Westwood, president-elect of the club, filling in today for our president, Mary Kramer. As usual, our first order of business is the introduction of new members who are with us today, and we have two who are in the audience. I'd like to introduce them to you. First, Arthur Marcus, Director of Interior Design for the Zimmer Gunsel Fra Frasca Partnership. There you are. And uh, Leslie Hildula, Partner at Training International. Welcome, both of you, to City Club. We have quite a few announcements today, and I'll go through them as quickly as I can, but I don't want to go too quickly over the report of the nominating committee of the City Club. The nominating committee has announced its proposed slate for the 1991-92 City Club Board Officers and Governors. Nominated for the Office of President-Elect is Patty Bedient, partner at Arthur Anderson and Company. Other officers nominated, Ramsey White, executive assistant to City Commissioner Gretchen Kafori for second vice president, and for treasurer Helen Lee, assistant vice president at First Interstate Bank of Oregon. Nominated to fill four open governorship positions are first Don Frisbee, chairman of Pacific Corps, Mary McWilliams, chief executive officer, Sisters of Providence, Oregon, Pub Sisters of Providence, Oregon Health Plans, Dr. Judith Ramele, President, Portland State University, and Isaac Regenstreich, Manager, Public Policy at Pacific Power. The nominations were made by this year's nominating committee, chaired by Alan Oliver, very capably, I might say, with members Don Barney, Ned Hayes, Karen Katz, Corleen Kraft, Gretchen Lashley, and me. Elections will be held at the City Club's annual meeting, which will be at our regular Friday meeting on May 31st, 1991. The City Club bylaws call for the current president-elect to become president, so I don't have to face an election, thank goodness, and the second vice president automatically to become first vice president for the following year. Article 5, Section 1 of the bylaws, you do have them in your pockets, of course, you'll want to take them out and read, states that other candidates for office may be nominated by any three members of the club, provided each nomination is made in writing to the Board of Governors at least two weeks prior to that May 31st election. Any such nominations to be effective have to include a signed statement from the nominee that the nominee would serve if elected. Deadline for nominations to be submitted to the Board through the Executive Director, Nancy Hedin, is Monday, March 20. Excuse me, Monday, May 20, 1991. Upcoming events at City Club. Wednesday, May, April 17th, an open forum titled Measure 5, Saving Dollars or Jeopardizing Public Safety. Sponsored by the Law and Public Safety Standing Committee, this program is the fourth in a series of what to date have been very successful open forums presented by individual standing committees on Measure 5. This program on Wednesday the 17th will feature a discussion of present law enforcement and emergency services, the impact Measure 5 may have on them. Speakers will be Robert Monog, Chief of the Portland Bureau of, of Fire, uh, Rescue and Emergency Services, and Tom Potter, the Chief of Police of the City of Portland. That will be Wednesday, April 17th, from noon to 1.30. Should be an interesting forum. It's at 2 World Trade Center, 25 Southwest Salmon Street at the bridge level. That's kind of a mezzanine, I think. Uh, conference rooms A and B. It is free, as always, and open to the public. Friday, April 19th, one week from today, we'll be hearing Don Clark, Executive Director of the Housing Authority of Portland and longtime, very active member of the City Club. He will speak on housing, disadvantaged populations, and local governance issues. Don Clark has served in elected capacities, well, shall I start? Multnomah County Executive, Multnomah County Commissioner, Chairman of the Board of the County Commissioners, and Multnomah County Sheriff. This, I should say, will also coincide, coincide with Don's retirement from the Housing Authority and will cap his long career in public service. I certainly plan to be here. I hope those of you who have known Don over the years will uh, come out and show your support and thank him for a job well done over the years serving the City of Portland and the metropolitan area. The third session of the City Club's leadership course, Pathways to Leadership, begins on May 2nd and runs through June 13th. This particular class is now filled to capacity, but if you would like to be placed on a first-come, first-served basis for the next class, which uh, will begin sometime afterwards, please call our executive director, Nancy Hedin, at 228-7231, and she will notify you when the next class is scheduled. 
I should add, City Club now has 33 roving ambassadors. I don't think they wear special uh, morning coats or anything, but uh, they're out in the community inviting people to join the club. Members are the club's greatest asset. Please do your part. Invite someone today to join City Club. Onward to today's program, and our board host today, seated at the head table to my far left, is Pete Baer, member of our Board of Governors and a loan officer for National Mortgage Company. He has the priv privilege, as usual, of asking the first question of our speaker. The second question will be asked from the microphone on the floor by Chuck Shattuck of the City Club's Business and Labor Standing Committee. As always, we open the meeting up to questions from City Club members only in the audience after our speaker's prepared remarks. Preference is given to questions from the microphone, but written questions uh, will be asked as time permits. You'll notice that forms for written questions are on your tables. Please hold them up after the speech so that City Club staff can gather them uh, if, you, if you have written questions you'd like to have asked of our speaker. Today's speaker is William H. Donaldson, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the New York Stock Exchange. He has been in that post since January 1st of this year, and although he certainly has been around the markets for a great many years, I'm sure that he's learned a lot and, and will be learning a lot because the markets, as we all know, are changing quite dramatically. I uh, talked to a stockbroker friend of mine in preparation for this introduction and said, well, what's new about the, the brokerage business that uh, I should know about? And he said, you know, one thing is we all consider it malpractice if the first thing we do when we come to work in the morning isn't to look and see how the European markets did overnight. This is something that we didn't have in the past. International trading is upon us. There are other issues, of course, too, and I hope that uh, if our speaker doesn't touch upon them that your questions may. The new readmittance of banks into the underwriting of equities. Um, NASDAQ recently, the, the over-the-counter exchange recently, ex and at times exceeding the uh, trading volume of the New York Stock Exchange, which itself is substantial. I'm, I'm told the volume today was well over 150 million shares. Uh, trading between institutions, such as pension funds, outside the exchange and out, outside of brokerages, bypassing them. What are the implications of that? These are all things that, uh, if not addressed in our speaker's speech today, certainly I think will be by the questions that you may ask. Mr. Donaldson has a long resume. I'll hit the high points. He was a co-founder and chief executive officer of the international investment banking firm of Donaldson, Lufkin, and Genrette uh, from 1959 to 1973. He then was a director of the New York Stock Exchange from 1972 to 1973 until he left the exchange to join the government. And he served then as Under Secretary of State for the United States, 1973 and 74. Then he served in the White House as Special Counsel and Advisor to Vice President Nelson Rockefeller in 1975. Where can you go from there? Well, he found somewhere to go. He was the founder and the first dean of the Yale Graduate School of Organization and Management and served in that capacity until 1980, and was a professor of management studies during that period at Yale. He is a director of several major American corporations. He's a director of the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. This fellow doesn't just go home at uh, night uh, after working in Manhattan. He has other things to do as well. He is a trustee of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And uh, he is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Mr. Donaldson graduated from Yale University and received his Master's in Business Administration with distinction from Harvard and holds an Honorary Master of Arts degree also from Yale University. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, William H. Donaldson. Thanks very much, Jim. It's a uh, real honor and pleasure to be here in Portland. I know that the uh, history of the City Club is, uh, spans, I'm told, some three quarters of a century. Uh, uh, if you put some perspective on that, uh, you, I guess you're just about a year older than the Russian Revolution, and, <laughs> and apparently you're going to outlive it. Uh, if my uh, look into the records is correct, uh, the year you were first organized, the Dow Jones Industrial Average ranged between 84 and 110. That's a swing of roughly 31%, uh, which makes some of today's market moves look uh, pretty tame. Uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, some of our days these days are a little bit busier. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange's yearly volume in the year 1916 was 232 million shares, 
and I suspect we'll do about that today. Uh, the figure you gave was uh, at noontime, so uh, we will do in one day uh, and do routinely what was done in a full year in 1916. Uh, you began this group uh, meeting in a time of war, uh, and today I, I think it's safe to say that we are meeting in a somewhat less troubled and more hopeful time. For you in this whole region, uh, it's a time when all the hard work of building greater diversity into your economy has really paid off in, uh, as I understand it, your trends here are, are solidly outpacing the national economy. And for the nation, uh, it's a time when we've just been through one of those moments in our history that draws us together and renews our faith and our national purpose. While we talk often about our problems, uh, social and economic, we've once again demonstrated our enormous ability to get things done, to accomplish great things. Now, if we can only focus uh, that determination on some of the business and economic problems facing the country, it becomes obvious that our competitive position in this shrinking world will be as strong only as we resolve to make it. And that really is the context in which I come here today. Uh, I suspect that a few of you would uh, like me to talk about the stock market, uh, what it's doing today and what it's going to do next week. Uh, I hate to admit it, I haven't the faintest idea. Uh, I think I'll leave the predictions to the market analysts. I was one a number of years ago and I was always thrilled when people forgot what I had to say. Uh, uh, what I'd like to focus on instead and ask you to do is, is some more fundamental matters. And these are matters that really influence directly our ability to maintain and build our economic strength and play our proper role in a global setting. For obviously what's a lot more important than the Dow Jones average is tomorrow's shape of the U.S. equities market. The question is how best to preserve and enhance the distinct competitive advantage we have gained from our central auction market method of pricing securities and its chief practitioner, the New York Stock Exchange. To begin with, I think we will try, or I will try, to see if we can understand together that combination of diversity and professionalism and advanced technology that makes this auction market so much better than any other system. In fact, it makes this market, in my view, the envy of the rest of the world. And then we can go on and examine what we should do to build on that strength. Let me classify this response under two categories. First is globalization and the need to move as quickly as possible to unshackle our markets from outdated rules so that we can be assured of continued leadership in the world. And second, that we make certain that we have a market that meets the investment needs of the broadest possible base of investors, from the largest to the very smallest. That includes dealing directly with individual investor concerns about volatility and the changing pattern of trading in today's markets. Now, I hope you won't consider these issues uh, strictly Wall Street problems, because as far as I'm concerned, the market really belongs to, to all of us, whether as individual investors, as participants in retirement programs, as business people seeking capital or managing investment funds, or as regulators charged with maintaining a market that is fair to all of those constituencies. I also hope that just for the moment, you'll be willing to perceive me not just as the uh, chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, but as a representative of all of those many interests and stakeholders in our market. Our equities markets play a central role in our economy. Over the years, the liquidity and absolutely unique self-regulatory mechanism have provided a repository for the savings of the country and an unparalleled source of capital for the neighbors and corporations and entrepreneurs. At the core of all of these markets is the most dominant auction market in the world, the nearly 200-year-old New York Stock Exchange, where almost 1,800 of our largest corporations in this country, including 27 located in this immediate region, have chosen to have their equity securities listed and traded. What we've learned after almost two centuries of experience is that the most effective market and the most liquid market is one that brings together the maximum number of buyers and sellers. 
It's a market that brings those participants together in a public and highly competitive auction process where price negotiation is conducted in a totally open environment. A market where customers know that when the transaction is completed, they have gotten the best price available because they've been given access to such a broad range of buyers and sellers and have been represented by agents in that process acting solely on their behalf. It's what we call a customer-driven market where buy and sell orders meet directly as opposed to a dealer-driven market where a dealer sets the price, where customers may be left with some lingering question about whether the price they were quoted was absolutely the best price of the day. More on that in just a couple of minutes. It's a market with sophisticated technology for order delivery and for the full and nearly instantaneous reporting and recording of all transactions. We've also learned that an effective market imposes those regulatory measures necessary to ensure that trading is fair and open to all investors. In sum, this is a, the best market is one that combines the most advanced technology with the skills and judgment of professionals representing the public. Now, because we as Americans committed ourselves long ago to maintaining that kind of a market, we have a vast and diverse investor community participating in our, in, in our particular market. Some 50 million Americans own shares directly or through stock mutual funds, and if you add the other entities such as retirement plans, at least three out of five Americans uh, are involved indirectly in the stock market. And that diversity, that participation by individuals is one of the main factors that differentiates our market from others in the world where the public has been so much less active. At present, we have a very strong central auction market. The New York Stock Exchange itself accounts for 85% of the value and number of shares traded in stocks listed on that exchange. We also have a competitive structure that involves regional exchanges. They're all tied together electronically to provide access to the best price in any one of these markets. That structure, like any other, has its flaws, but it's a carefully balanced structure that has served investors well and provided incentives for individual markets to improve their services and increase their efficiency. I've been an active participant in that market long before I took my current job, and I think I can say uh, without hesitation that there no other system serves investors as well. Not electronic dealer markets that serve only a segment of the investor population and sidestep the public spotlight, the full regulation, and the full competitive auction price, not internalized trading by trading firms and not foreign markets with their inferior liquidity and far less regulation. Those markets, the three that I just uh, ticked off, have the effect and can have the increasing effect of fencing off individual groups of investors and depriving all of them, the large institution as well as a small hundred share buyer of the full benefits of a complete auction process. Dealing in one of those limited access markets is roughly analogous, I feel, to going into a store to buy an expensive item uh, without being able to go out and do comparison shopping uh, to make sure that you're getting the best price. If you contrast that with our auction market, where buyers and sellers from all over the world, through their representatives, come together to trade with each other. If a buyer can find a seller and agree upon a price in an auction market through their agent, uh, the transaction takes place and the dealer, and in our market we call a dealer the specialist, simply steps aside. And that happens in over 90% of the transactions that take place on the New York Stock Exchange. Individual buyers find individual sellers, agree on a price, and the specialist does not intervene. However, if the customers can't get together and agree upon a price, then the specialists have two obligations. The first is to make a continuous market, to step in and make a transaction to keep the market going. But secondly, and, and very importantly, they have an absolute obligation 
not to trade ahead of any public order. In other words, they can only step into the market and make a bid and offer counter to the trend of the market if there is no public order ahead of them. I believe the specialist system uh, with those obligations is absolutely vital to the auction market as opposed to a dealer market where the dealer has both sides of every trade and is allowed to step ahead of the public. If you'll allow me to get a, a, a little bit technical just to try and explain uh, in, in somewhat more detail what I'm talking about. Let's suppose that there is a dealer who is offering to buy XYZ stock at $40 a share and he's also offering to sell it at 40 and a half. The bid then is 40 and the offer is 40 and a half. If the dealer has public orders, if you, anybody in this room, uh, uh, has an order to buy or sell stock, uh, he has no, the, the dealer uh, has no obligation uh, to execute those orders in between that bid and ask. In other words, if you want to sell it at, at 40, you've got to sell to him at 40. If you want to buy, you've got to buy from him at 40 and a half. So even if there are people out there amongst you who are willing to buy and sell at 40 and a quarter, and somebody else is willing to buy or sell at 40 and a quarter, they can't find each other in that dealer market. The dealer makes the profit in between, whereas in an auction market, uh, the transaction, instead of taking place at 40 uh, or at 40 and a half, takes place at 40 and a quarter. I, I've oversimplified, but that's the essential difference between the, what we call the, the price discovery aspect of an auction market. Public buyers meet public sellers. Now, individuals and organizations have come along from time to time and claim that they can provide a better pricing mechanism. And to the extent that they succeed in, in convincing people of this, they are lessening, uh, not increasing, the competitive pricing competition that makes the auction market work so well. If the auction market loses business because customers are genuinely served elsewhere, uh, as far as I'm concerned, so be it. The auction market has to improve on that. But if the auction market loses as a result of loss of focus on the end customer or because of some shortcut around competitive pricing or market access, then we're on the way to losing the balance and integrity that we've so carefully built into our system over almost 200 years. This discussion of the auction market uh, leads me directly to the competitive strength of our equities markets on a global scale. Strong national markets compete the best internationally. In fact, what we see in the world today is a move by other nations toward a centralization of their markets. The best example is what is likely to come out of the uh, prospective confederation in Western Europe. If our nation is going to compete effectively in that international arena, we've got to think about our equities market more in international and global terms. Twenty years ago, our country accounted for about two-thirds of all the capitalization of publicly traded companies in the world. Today, with so many strong economies throughout the world, we have less than a third. We estimate at the New York Stock Exchange that there are more than 2,000 companies out there outside the United States which meet the New York Stock Exchange's financial criteria in terms of number of owners and number of shares outstanding and size of the business. At least 300 of them would be considered world-class companies. Currently, among our 1,800 listed companies, only 100 are non-U.S. Why? This is because presently, we are obliged by federal regulations to hold any foreign company wishing to list its shares in this country to our U.S. generally accepted public accounting, auditing, disclosure, and reporting standards. That's true no matter how successful or how well regulated the company is in its home country. Meeting two different standards, having two different profit and loss statements and balance sheets is an extremely costly item for a foreign country company. Uh, it causes all sorts of problems for them domestically in, in terms of their labor force and regulatory authorities and so forth. And as a result, it has discouraged many, if not most, foreign companies from listing here in the United States. American investors do have 
and already a very sizable stake in foreign companies, directly or more often through mutual funds specializing in choosing and holding these overseas equities. These holdings reached a figure of 91 billion by the end of 1989, and that included 13 billion that was added in that year alone. That's six times what it was a decade ago. As far as I'm concerned, there's not much point in being inflexible on foreign company accounting standards uh, when we only fence in the United States and we force U.S. investors to go around our marketplace and to go overseas to buy those stocks in Frankfurt or London or Tokyo. In other words, we, we are forcing our investors to go into other markets. Those markets are less liquid and less rel well regulated and obviously the the uh, pairing and, and, and pyramiding of, of intermediaries makes it a very expensive proposition. What I'm suggesting and have suggested is that we and our regulators and Congress, if necessary, find a way to let at least that top 300 companies, the world-class companies, list in this country now. Let them choose where they want to list, on the New York Stock Exchange or in the over-the-counter market. And by the way, the median market capitalization of those companies exceeds $4 billion compared with a $350 million median for our current New York Stock Exchange list. If they were to list on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, there are a lot of different things we could do. One suggestion would be that investors would be advised that these companies trade under a rule exemption and that the companies abide by home country standards. They could be marked with a little uh, F on our, our trade uh, tape. The alternative is to develop international accounting standards. But when you think about the fact that we can't in this country even agree on what our standards should be, uh, it's going to be a long time waiting for the world to come to a common standard. There's another important aspect to this whole issue of global investing. We've got to, in my view, maintain the full diversity of participation in this auction process. Individuals are an absolutely vital part of that. We've got to overcome any perception that the market is no longer a good place for them. Part of that is reminding individual investors that markets may go through uh, up and down days with sharp price fluctuations. They may rise and fall with a business cycle, but over the long haul, on average, no marketable asset class has done as well as common stocks. Just to give you a few numbers, the compound annual rate of return on a Standard & Poor's 500 has averaged 12% over 40 years. It's averaged 14% over the last 10 years. If you want to go all the way back for as long uh, to where the statistics begin 90 years ago in 1900, uh, Stocks, common stocks, have performed roughly twice as well on a total return basis as bonds, and perhaps more important, they have outpaced in their performance inflation by a factor of three. Still, uh, short-term market activity can be nerve-wracking for all of us. And so the New York Stock Exchange has taken a number of steps to deal with investor concerns about market volatility and one of its perceived ca causes, program trading, especially in the form of index arbitrage. Program trading it simply means the simultaneous buying and selling of sizable groups of stocks rather than just individual issues. It's, it's defined as buying 15 issues or more worth at least a million dollars or more at one time. Index arbitrage is a little bit more complicated. It's the most prevalent kind of program trading and can involve many instruments, uh, stocks and options and index futures traded in large quantities at blinding speeds. The point in index arbitrage is to exploit small discrepancies between the cash market and, and related futures market. Much of the time, that kind of trading works to increase market liquidity, but in too many situations, it appears to create unnecessary volatility in prices. In response to that, the New York Stock Exchange has undertaken a number of actions, the most important of which uh, is that we have established a, an individual 
uh, Investor Express Delivery Service, IIEDS. And what that means is that no matter how heavy the flow of orders from institutions, program trading and otherwise, an individual's market order will go to the head of the line on a busy day to be executed uh, peri passu with the largest investor so that the 100 share order goes to the head of the line even though there's a million share order there. Secondly, we've put in a series of new rules, uh, the most recent and effective of which has puts very strict limitations on index arbitrage orders when the market is up 50 points or down 50 points, forcing those index arbitrage orders to go counter to the market if the market has bounced up or down 50 points. In other words, if it's up 50 points, those index arbitrage orders must remove themselves and go counter to the market trend. Those, true, those rules became effective last summer and have been widely praised for easing volatility, particularly during this period of very high uncertainty associated with the Persian Gulf crisis. They've been activated some two dozen times, as a matter of fact, as recently as last Tuesday when the market was off uh, over 50 points, Rule 88 clicked in and the market did turn. So we think we've learned something from, from those uh, rather frightening days of 1987. Also, over the past decade, we've added significantly to our whole surveillance and enforcement activities to make the market a place where individual investors uh, of all kinds can trade with confidence. Today, when our stock watch computers tell us that something is amiss and we have a constant monitoring of, of activity in a stock exchange, we now have databases that enable us to pinpoint that activity, to find out who was involved in that sort of activity, and to get right on top of anything that suggests that there's been any sort of manipulative act action. We've recently added uh, a whole new system of, of artificial intelligence which just dramatically increases the speed with which our investigators can get and analyze such information. The New York Stock Exchange has spent some six hundred million dollars over the last decade to make this market the most advanced in the world. Our technology permits us to receive and transact and report back orders electronically anywhere in the world in an average turnaround time of 28 seconds. Still, uh, I would be the first to say that we're not perfect. Like every other system, we've got to improve what we're doing, and we're going to continue uh, to work at that, I, I guarantee you that, to improve and, and adapt to what is a, a world of, of accelerating change. We're also absolutely determined to do all we can to encourage individual investment in equities not just through mutual funds, but directly. We believe that both kinds of participation are important and that individuals are fully capable of making wise investment decisions. To quote uh, Peter Lynch, who was the former Magellan Fund wizard, he said that uh, dumb money is only dumb when it listens to the smart money. <laughs> Trying to compete as a day trader is a lot more risky than picking good companies likely to succeed over the long term and sticking with them. What I've tried to do in, in just these few minutes is to enlist your, your interest, uh, your understanding, and, and your help in, in supporting the kind of market that uh, I feel we need in the years ahead. As I've said, it's, it's got to be a market that offers the best of the world in terms of investment opportunities, foreign companies as well as U.S. companies. It's got to be a market that, that carefully accommodates but balances all the diverse investment goals and strategies while preventing any single class of investor from gaining advantage over another by virtue of size or, or technological capacity. Peter Drucker says that uh, economic results are not produced by economic forces, they are human achievement. We have, in my view, in, in this auction market, something, as I said before, that is the envy of the rest of the world. We've got to have the imagination and the flexibility to protect what I consider to be a vital national asset and to take the further steps necessary to achieve a whole new level of global leadership. Jim, I'll 
stop there, and, and I would be uh, delighted to take any questions. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Donaldson. Our, our first question will be asked by Pete Bear, our today's board host. I tried to wheedle this out of him, but he wouldn't tell me. <laughs> uh, Mr. Donaldson, uh, actually, I'm going to change my question a little uh, because you pretty well covered the, uh, the small investor and uh, the results of the uh, program trading. But I guess. Uh, my perception, and having been a small investor in 1987 when the market was uh, tumbling some 600 points and wondering if it was going to stop at zero, uh, is that the market now is dominated by large institutions, or so it seems uh, to a smaller investor. And incidentally, I'm still around as an investor. But, uh, uh, what, if anything, can you do to change the perception of the small investor and draw them back into the fold, uh, into the marketplace, because if anything, uh, the small investor contributes somewhat to the liquidity of the market. And it seems that they have stayed away uh, in fairly sizable numbers uh, since the, the massive decline of 1987. Right. Well, you know, as I said earlier, we, we've done a number of things. Uh, I, I think that the most important thing that, that uh, we can do is to get people to focus on the long-term benefits of, of owning common stock. I think that there's been a, a uh, feeling, uh, particularly in the, in the soaring 80s, of, of increased pace of things and increased short-term attitudes and trying to outguess the next guy and perhaps treating uh, the stock exchange as, as though it were a, a gambling casino of some sort, uh, and that has not been helped uh, or mitigated by the volatility. Uh, what I think people have to bear in mind is that while there will always be speculators in the marketplace, there will always be people who are following all sorts of different either short-term or intermediate-term uh, investment philosophies, uh, point-and-figure charts, there are lots of different approaches, that the only thing that is is I won't say absolutely predictable, but darn close to predictable, is that, that the long-term history of long-term investing is that it works out pretty well. It's a pretty good place to have your money. And if you can treat it in, in a long term, with a long-term view and, and look at those kinds of returns that, that I talked about, then these day-to-day -day fluctuations, instead of bothering you, become opportunities, opportunities to buy stocks when they're down, when nobody wants them, when a wave of selling has gone through, to, to identify good companies, uh, to pick those good companies, and then to, to stick with them for the long haul. So part of this is, is convincing investors to become just that, investors and, and not speculators. And again, the speculators are, are welcome because they add liquidity to our marketplace. Then the, the second whole range of, of things is, is to try as much as we can to dampen down the volatility. And I must say that, that uh, volatility, uh, the academic studies indicate that the market is no more volatile today than, than it's ever been. Uh, I have some problems myself with some of those studies because I have problems. It's a little bit like uh, measuring the level of a sea, you know, after a storm at the end of every month. I mean, you know, for somebody who was in the middle of that storm, it was a pretty volatile time, although the measurement might say that the sea is at the same level as it was at the beginning of the month before. So that uh, there, there is uh, certainly a perception that the market is more volatile. Part of that perception comes from the fact that the market averages are, are at a much higher level, with the Dow Jones flirting with 3,000 clearly a 50 or 100 point move is nowhere near as significant as a 50 or 100 point move was when the Dow was at 500. And it's hard for a lot of us, myself included, to get used to that. So part of it is perception. Uh, and part of it, we've got to try and do something about. Uh, you can say, well, you shouldn't allow uh, index arbitrage between these markets to happen. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think the, the genie is out of the, the bottle, if you will, in terms of the rapid development of futures markets. And, and if, if we don't accommodate uh, 
trading in the, in the cash market in some way, uh, the, that, that trading will come back in through other foreign markets. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't have a disparity between futures and, and, and cash markets. So that all we can do is try and make sure that these professional traders with their computers uh, aren't taking a technological advantage over the individual. That's a longer answer than you wanted, but that's, that's what we're trying to do, and we're going to continue to try and do that. This Rule 80A that I mentioned, I think, throws just enough uh, sand into the mechanism, if you will, and slows the thing down just enough so that it doesn't totally disengage these two markets, but it, it, it slows down that volatility. Our second and subsequent questions will come from the floor, and the uh, second question goes to Chuck Shattuck, member of Business and Labor Standing Committee. Uh, Mr. Donaldson, uh, pursuing a little farther on the small investor, long-term investor returning to the market, in the limelight today, both politically and economically, is the capital gains tax and its influence on the market. Uh, what is your feeling about the possibility of changes? What should they do? What would be their results? Or should any changes be made in the current structure? Capital, capital gains tax. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, I, I think that uh, that we have. Uh, a major problem uh, in this country in terms of our savings rate. Uh, I, I think that uh, we've been through a period of a, uh, more than a decade where, where everybody is uh, up to their eyeballs, and that includes individuals, and it includes companies, and it includes our government in debt. Uh, and everybody has gone out and, and uh, bought uh, and forward bought. Uh, and as a result, our nation's saving rate is, is extremely low relative to other countries in the world, and we've got to do something about changing that savings rate, changing the attitudes. One of the things that we can do, I believe, is, is to do something about the capital gains rate in this country. Uh, and again, uh, unfortunately, this has become a, a real political football, and, and it, it, it's gotten down to the point where uh, somehow uh, capital gains and, and the prospective reduction of capital gains uh, is being pictured as, as favoring a, a, a less affluent uh, section of the populace and favoring the wealthy section of the populace. In my view, uh, the capital gains rate and a reduction in the capital gains rate will benefit everyone. It, it, it will help people uh, save money, uh, help them save more money. Uh, I believe it will have a positive impact actually on, on tax revenues itself, first of all, by, by loosening and freeing up capital gains that are locked in by the high rates, and then eventually by stimulating the whole entrepreneurial uh, part of our economy. We've seen that when, when the capital gains rates came down. We've seen the blossoming of, of venture capital in, in the uh, 70s and 80s, uh, and I believe uh, we, it would provide a, a major stimulus. Unfortunately, uh, as I said before, it's become highly politicized in Washington. There's not much objectivity looking at what the possible effects will be. Everybody comes up with their own numbers, uh, depending upon what side of the argument they're on. Uh, I hope that uh, Chairman Greenspan, Alan Greenspan, who's been asked by the president to, uh, to uh, do a study on capital gains, will, will have the prestige, which he does, and, and the objectivity as chairman of the Federal Reserve to give us some unbiased numbers on that. So I eagerly await his, his, uh, his report to the president. I'm not optimistic politically that, that this is going to happen uh, soon, however. Mr. Donaldson, what would happen if the Dow was represented in percentage uh, difference rather than in points fluctuation. How would that affect especially the small... Uh, what would happen if the Dow uh, uh, was represented on a daily basis in percentage change rather than in points change? How especially would that affect the perception of the small investor and those who used to be very nervous when it moved 100 points? That, that's a, uh, a you know, very sound thought. It's something that, that uh, 
you know, a lot of people have talked about for, for a long time. Uh, unfortunately, we are a nation with, uh, with entrenched habits. Uh, the Dow Jones average really is, is uh, not a particularly good average in, in terms of, of telling uh, all of us what's actually gone on in, in the whole marketplace. I mean, it's a, it's a very narrow range, a very narrow based average. Uh, the trouble is that people are used to using it. And, and uh, although there are many other averages uh, that, that are used by professionals to gauge the breadth and, and real direction of the overall market, still the Dow is what the newspapers pick up. It's what we're all used to. And we have the same problem in terms of, of changing uh, that to a percentage uh, calculation, that people are not used to it. Uh, the average itself is, is owned by the, the Dow Jones company. Uh, and, and they've been reluctant to change it in, in practical terms. Uh, I think it would be an interesting thing to start, uh, maybe to run it in parallel with, uh, with what, uh, what, what's done right now. My name's Dave Olson. I'm a member of the club. I'd like to continue your uh, direction there on personal savings because as our personal savings have declined, the United States debt has quadrupled. The Japanese are great savers, so they're buying a good percentage of our bonds, which makes us very vulnerable in the bond market if they should ever back off and say, we're afraid of the inflationary aspects of America and the interest rates aren't high enough. What do you think about that whole international picture of savings and what it could do to our bond market? Well, uh I think that, uh, number one, if, if we have an increased uh, savings rate, uh, I, I think that uh, at least some of that money will uh, go to buy, to be invested in our own government debt, uh, and, and that will be a vehicle as long, along with common stocks, uh, and, and, and therefore we should become less dependent on, on uh, the Japanese and others because we'll have more demand from domestic sources to buy that debt. I think the real problem uh, in this country, as I say, has, has been that, that we have borrowed uh, and borrowed and borrowed uh, and, and have mortgaged the future. Uh, and, and we as a, as a nation uh, have not been making uh, the investments that we should. I mean, we just have to not in this beautiful part of the country, but, but look at some of the infrastructure back where where I come from and the roads and the highways and the bridges and, and you name it are, are uh, falling apart and, and we have not made the kind of investments that we should as a country uh, because we've been spending uh, too much money. Uh, and I think individually uh, we've got to train ourselves uh, to save more money. Uh, the Japanese uh, have had an extremely high savings rate. They're possibly uh, going the other way now in, in, in terms of their economy. They haven't had to have the international burdens that we have. I mean, they, they, they have not had to maintain a military force and, uh, as, as we have, so they haven't had the expenditure needs that we've had. But uh, they're beginning to, their savings rate is, is starting to go down now. The Japanese are consuming more. Uh, there's going to be more leverage in their economy. But I, I, to me, it's, uh, it's, it's savings are, are the key, and, and deleveraging of this country is the key to our, our future growth. The problem is that if we took us 10 or 15 years to get into this situation, we're not going to turn it around overnight. And the process of turning it around is, is painful. I mean, we're seeing that in our banking system. We're seeing it uh, in, in terms of the recession we're in right now, the reduced buying, the, depressed nature of the automotive industry. Uh, it, it, in order to get off the high, high debt uh, loads that we have, we, we have a slowdown in economic activity, uh, and that's not much fun for people who are caught into that, particularly people who are, uh, you know, lose their employment and so forth. It's painful, painful for all of us. But to me, it's, it's, it's a necessary adjustment to set the stage for uh, future growth. I'm Mr. Donaldson, Jim Larpenter, member of the City Club. On the subject of insider trading, what weapons do you and the SEC have 
and what weapons would you like to have in order to combat insider trading and would you comment on their effectiveness? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, in, in terms of the weapons that we do have, we, we, we have uh, almost 500 people uh, at the New York Stock Exchange on our staff uh, concerned with regulation, uh, concerned with, with market surveillance, concerned with the regulation of our member firms, and concerned with issues such as uh, insider trading. We uh, have, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, invested a tremendous amount of money in, in surveillance systems, in a data bank. I mean, we know uh, uh, every director and officer of, of every listed company uh, is in our data bank. Uh, if we see activity going on in a stock that, that uh, bothers us, we have ways of, of getting behind the, activity, behind the activity into our member firms, finding out who it was, seeing if there is any sort of possible abuse. Now, the, the first line on uh, eliminating uh, insider trading it remains in, in the self-regulatory aspect of, of our member firms themselves. And, and there's been a, a significant increase in, in the regulatory aspect, the regulatory department and member firms. They are charged by us, the New York Stock Exchange, to know their customer, uh, to know their customers well enough to, to, to have some red flags show when orders are given to them that might be improper. Uh, we are the second line of defense, of the New York Stock Exchange, as I say, with, with resources that, that really far exceed the SECs. Uh, and we work very closely with the SEC in terms of, of turning over to them uh, when the enforcement or, or investigative uh, aspect of, of what we uncover requires more uh, uh, subpoena power and, and, and more legal power than we have over our member firms. We turn it over to the SEC and they go after these people. So that I, I think that, uh, that insider trading narrowly defined uh, uh, we're, we're really on top of that. What, what's more complicated, and is getting more complicated every day, is the, the increasing interrelationship between markets that we regulate and, and these other markets, uh, futures markets and, and, and uh, overseas markets and so forth. And, and with the new trading techniques, some of the things that, that we might consider to be not necessarily insider trading, but perhaps front-running, uh, perhaps buying, uh, you know, in anticipation of orders that we know are being, somebody knows are being executed in another market. These are, these are very uh, difficult things to A, track down, and B, the, the, uh, it's a gray area. It's not as, as clear as to what is clearly illegal and what is uh, uh, equally clear or unclear as, as to what is just good business practice. I mean, clearly, uh, uh, different markets in this country have very different attitudes toward that. The kind of, of uh, transactions that take place in certain futures markets just don't pay any attention to that sort of thing. They don't have the tradition that our equity markets do have. Again, a long answer, but I think that we would like, I, I think we're spending uh, a lot of money. Uh, I think we're on top of it, and, and I, I, I won't say there is never going to be any insider trading again, but clearly the enforcement cases that have been brought by ourselves uh, and by the SEC has, has really put a warning out there. And we've, we've been, uh, you know, the kind of fines that we're giving out now and so forth will be a continual warning to people that it's, uh, it's not uh, fair play, and we won't stand for it. Ray Polani, a City Club member. Uh, Mr. Donaldson, what do you think are the prospects that now, with the Gulf War over, we can have a peace dividend invested in infrastructure rebuilding uh, to include uh, also the private railroads? Uh, I said, uh, with, the, with the end of the Gulf War, what are the prospects that we could have a peace dividend, which we were hoping to have and didn't get, uh, to be reinvested in infrastructure rebuilding, including private railroads? Well, I think the, uh, the actual uh, 
cost of the war itself uh, is going to turn out to come in uh, at, at somewhat less than uh, was anticipated. I mean, in other words, it was an expensive proposition, but the war uh, was over a lot faster than most anybody thought, and, and it, it, quote, cost in, in terms of dollars a lot less than people thought. I think that we're in a period now where the the follow-on to that, and uh, you know, in terms of, of the devastation that exists in, in that part of the world, and uh, depending upon your views, the, the obligations that the uh, United Nations uh, allies have to, to uh, pay attention to the, the people out in that part of the world is going to be a very expensive uh, proposition. Uh, likewise, I, I think that we're going to see a shift in, in uh, military spending. We're already seeing that, uh, but that doesn't just mean reduced military spending, it, it means spending uh, on different sorts of weapons, you know, based on the experience we had out there, uh, you know, more of a, of a uh, str less strategic and more tactical kinds of weapons. Clearly, uh, what's going on in Russia now uh, in the USSR and, and uh, is, is kind of scary as far as I'm concerned, and, and that certainly uh, makes one wonder what, you know, you can conjure up some, some really uh, horrible things coming out of that, that anarchy that apparently is escalating every day. So I'm, I'm not optimistic that the peace dividend that looked like it was uh, a sure thing uh, a, a year ago when, when there were no problems in, in uh, Eastern Europe and Russia looks like it was headed in the right direction. I'm not sure we're going get to get that dividend too soon. Well, my investments, I know, are resting safer, and uh, I think all of ours are, thanks to uh, Mr. Donaldson and what is obviously a, an enlightened and, and humane approach to the marketplace. As we adjourn, please uh, join me in thanking William Donaldson for his fine presentation today. <laughs>